Well, it is good uh, to be together and to gather to worship Christ. Um, if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. As I was thinking about what passage we could set our minds on this morning, uh, what passage could be uh, an anchor and a direction for our new year, I was drawn to Philippians chapter 3. Let me read verses 12 to 14, and then we'll open in a word of prayer. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do come before you this morning, Lord, thankful for the truths that we have been meditating on this last month, uh, the truth of your incarnation, Lord, that you came to die so that we might live. And as the scriptures say, that we would no longer live for ourselves, but live for you. Lord, help us now this morning as we look at this passage to live lives that glorify you in 2022. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, the holidays allow us to pause, to relax, to, to take a little bit of a break. And this was even true on December 24th, 1914. Five months into World War I, a mysterious peace washed over the Western Front. On Christmas Eve, with rounds being fired in the background, German soldiers began to sing Silent Night from their muddy trenches. After some time, the British troops started to join in the singing, and before long, the sound of Christmas carols resounded throughout empty battlefields. The singing continued throughout the night until, at first light on Christmas Day, German soldiers got out of their trenches, crossed no man's land, and began calling out Merry Christmas. At first, Allied soldiers thought it was a trick, but seeing the Germans unarmed, they too got out of their trenches and greeted the enemy soldiers. The men exchanged presents, they sang carols, and according to some reports, they even played a game of soccer. It was a time of rest. But what happened the next day was the men got back into their trenches and the war continued. The peace was short-lived. And the reality is, is rest is good but it doesn't make the war go away. For those specific men, any indifference or, or apathy or laziness on December 26th could have cost them their lives. Because in war, passivity and complacency is a dangerous thing. The same is true in our Christian lives. You see, rest is good but it doesn't make the war go away. Passivity and laziness and complacency are dangerous if we allow them to slip into our lives. And we see this throughout the New Testament. The Christian life is, is not passive, but it's an active pursuit. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says that the Christian life should be compared to that of a soldier, or an athlete, or a farmer. In Ephesians 6.12, he, 
he compares the life of a Christian to a wrestling match. And towards the end of his life, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul triumphantly declared that I have fought the good fight. The Christian life is an active pursuit. But Paul's favorite illustration for the Christian life, his, his most used athletic metaphor, is that of running a race. And so in our passage this morning, Paul uses this imagery of, of running a race to remind us not to be complacent in our spiritual lives. Paul doesn't want us to be on cruise control. He, he warns us not to enjoy rest while there's a war going on around us. In this section of Philippians, Paul wants to inspire you to run hard after spiritual maturity in Christ, to pursue Christ. And so this morning in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, we will see four principles for running the race of the Christian life. Four principles to help us glorify God with our lives in 2022. And the first principle for running the race of the Christian life is a sincere dissatisfaction. A sincere dissatisfaction. Look at verse 12. Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul here is, is modeling a holy discontentment with his spiritual progress. He's stressing the incompleteness of his spiritual journey. Paul says, not that I have already obtained this. That word obtained, it means to, to take hold of or, or to grasp. And what is it that Paul has not yet obtained? He doesn't specifically mention it in verse 12, but the context of verses 8 through 11 Help us to see what Paul is striving after. He says in verse 8 that he desired to, to know and to gain Christ. In verse 9, to be found in Christ. And verse 10, to become like Christ. And all of these things find their, their culmination and their fulfillment in verse 11, in the resurrection of the dead. You see, Paul wanted to gain Christ. His supreme desire was to take hold of Christ. And while Paul desired to grow in his relationship, while Paul desired this spiritual maturity, he realized that he had not yet arrived at this goal. Paul knows that, that he won't be perfect until he sees the risen Christ and is totally transformed by Christ's power. And if Paul confesses that he has not yet arrived at spiritual maturity, if Paul acknowledges that he still has much to grow in, then how much more should we? Right? Paul, the man who took the gospel to the Gentiles, who spread the gospel throughout the Mediterranean world. Paul, who, who wrote numerous New Testament books. Paul, who was taken up to the third heaven. If Paul, one of the most committed and mature Christians who ever live, confessed that he had not yet arrived or become perfect, then how much more should we and in case he's, he's not clear in verse 12, he repeats himself in verse 13. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Paul has this sincere dissatisfaction with his spiritual maturity. He made an honest assessment of his condition. And he admitted his need for growth. And this truth, is essential to, to your growth. 
This truth is essential to our sanctification. Because if we desire to to run this race, if we desire to, to grow in personal holiness, then we must have a sincere dissatisfaction of where we're at. A holy discontentment that that we are not where we want to be spiritually. You see, you won't grow if you don't think you need to grow. You won't press on striving for maturity if you do not think that there's something left for you to obtain. Think about this. A runner has no reason to continue the race if he believes he's already crossed the finish line. And in the same way as Christians, if we think that we have reached spiritual perfection, then we will not press on. And you say, well, I wouldn't say that I've become perfect The reality is, is that without saying the words, we can become to develop the attitude that we've already arrived, right? If we're not careful, we can develop an inaccurate view of ourselves, a view that leaves us spiritually stagnant, a view that makes us content with our spiritual position. If we're not careful, we can become complacent. And the reason, the reason that we often get this way is because we compare ourselves to other Christians. Have you ever done this? I'm a better person than that person. You know, I'm I'm a part of a Bible study. I attend equipping hour. I... I even go to the monthly prayer meeting. You begin to analyze. You begin to say, well, I think I'm doing pretty well. Ask yourself, is this true of you? Search your heart this morning if you share this attitude with the Apostle Paul. Have you become complacent or or content in your walk with Christ? Have you become relaxed in in your Bible reading, in your prayer, in practicing one another's? Evaluate this morning. Use this morning as an opportunity to evaluate how you're doing spiritually. As we think, as we, we come into 2022, where are you at with the Lord? Do you love Christ as you ought to? Is Christ your your first love? Is is he your ultimate priority that everything else is filtered through? Are you striving to know him more every day? And if we're honest with ourselves, if as we look at this passage, we should develop a, a holy discontentment, a sincere dissatisfaction with our condition. See, the way that we develop this dissatisfaction is not comparing ourselves to others, is not by comparing ourselves to a standard that we create, but rather by examining ourselves according to Christ and his word. And as we compare ourselves to God's standard, we see just how short our character falls You see, the more you come to know Christ in his word, the more you come to sense your need to grow. The godlier you are, the the greater your awareness of and sensitivity to sin. Each day as, as you begin to grow in Christ, each day as you, like the Apostle Paul, strive to know Christ, you begin to sense more and more your sin. One author said it this way. He said, it's, It is only those who continue to recognize the need to eliminate sin and to cultivate holiness who will make progress in the Christian life. To, to run the race of the Christian life 
in order for us to, to glorify God more and more each day in 2022, we need to develop a sincere dissatisfaction with our spiritual maturity. And that sincere dissatisfaction leads to a second, a strenuous pursuit. The second principle for, for running the race of the Christian life is a strenuous pursuit. Paul's dissatisfaction here doesn't lead to discouragement. His imperfections don't stifle him from pursuing Christ. Rather than causing him to quit, rather than throwing in the towel and giving up, Paul's sense of incompleteness compels him to press on. Right? You, you know this feeling. You have a goal and you can't reach it, but you just keep trying. And you see, you see progress each and every day and, and it leads you to press on. Look again at verse 12. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Running the race of the Christian life requires a devotion and an ambition. We see here a, a diligent pursuit after spiritual maturity. He says, I press on. And again, he repeats himself in verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That phrase, to, to press on, it means to move rapidly and decisively toward an object. It's an active and an, an earnest endeavor. The reality is, is that spiritual fitness, just like physical fitness, it takes sweat. It takes work. And interestingly, that, that word, press on, in verse 12, is the same word that Paul used in Philippians 3, 6 in his zealous persecution of the church. He says in Philippians 3, 6, as to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. That word zeal in verse 6 is that same word press on in verse 12. Paul is saying that he now devotes that same intense energy and effort that he once directed toward persecuting the church of Jesus Christ to now pursuing Christ's likeness. He had a zeal just as Paul had once followed hard after those who followed Christ. Paul now says, in the same way, he's following hard after holiness. Before, he, he was seeking Christians out in every corner where he could find them so that he could persecute them. Now he's saying, I earnestly seek out holiness in every corner of my life. We're to press on. You see, the Christian life, friends, is no passive endeavor. Hebrews 12, 14, it says, Strive for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Or in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Paul uses this imagery of the Christian race, and he says, Do you not know? That in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? And he says, so run that you may obtain it. Is your life marked by this pursuit? Ask yourself this morning, how much effort goes into your Christian life? Can you say that, that you're pressing on as you look at 2021 is, and you look forward to how you're going to structure your days in 2022, what your priorities are going to be, how much time 
and energy and devotion are you going to apply to pursuing Christ? Running the race of the Christian life is a strenuous pursuit. And what's the goal of this? Why does Paul work so hard? Why must we as believers in Christ press on? Look at verse 12. Again, Paul says, But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That word, make it my own, it means to, to seize or, or to catch something. Paul is running, trying to catch something. And he's trying to catch the very thing for which Christ came after him. Paul's goal, in other words, Paul's goal in life was consistent with Christ's goal in saving him. Paul's goal in life was consistent with Christ's goal of saving him. And what was Christ's goal in, in saving Paul? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8, 29, we read, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Why? To be conformed to the image of his Son. God chose Paul to make him like Jesus. The purpose for which God saved us, the reason why God saved you and me is the purpose for which we live. To be conformed to the image of Christ. We were saved to become like Christ, to be conformed, Romans 8, into the image of his Son. The reason that you're to press on, the reason that you and I are, are to press on is the very reason for which we were saved. The Christian life is a pursuit after Christ-likeness. Paul says, I press on. I want to make it my own. I want to strive after all that God has planned for me. And notice this. Uh, Paul's not pressing on to be saved. Paul's not pressing on to be saved. Paul is, is pressing on because Christ saved him. Paul never thought about pursuing Christian holiness until Christ took hold of him. Paul had no desire to love Jesus and to make Jesus his, no, his own prior to Christ saving him. It was because Christ saved Paul. It was because Christ justified Paul by his grace that Paul now strives after holiness. Right? 1 John 1, 9. It says, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. We strive to know Christ more because Christ first for new us. You see that, that justification is the necessary prerequisite to sanctification. Uh, being saved by God's grace is a, is a precondition to pursuing holiness. To put it in the language of Philippians chapter 2, you can't work out your salvation with fear and trembling if you have no salvation to begin with. If Christ has not saved you by his grace. So if you're here today and you've never repented of your sin, and you've never trusted in Christ's righteousness alone, if you find yourself trying to earn salvation, cease trying to run the Christian life. Instead, re receive the Christian life. Repent of your sin and come to Christ first of all. Believing in Jesus first of all. And then, by God's grace, as a believer, covered in the righteousness of Christ, then you run the race. Not trying to earn God's favor, but we run the race 
because God has shown us favor. And that glorious truth that amazing reality that Christ has saved us from our sin, that fuels our fight against sin. That fuels our race. That gives us a, a motivation to press on and pursue holiness. The reason that God saved you, believer, is to conform you into his image. And so if that is the purpose of our salvation. If that is the reason that God saved you, then you better order your entire life around that purpose. If we're going to run the race and glorify God in 2022, then we must strenuously pursue Christ-likeness. The third reality that we see in this text is that to run the Christian life, to run the race, requires a, a singular focus. We need a singular focus to, to grow in Christ and to glorify God in 2022. Look with me at verse 13. Paul writes, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. In light of this realization from the Apostle Paul that he's not yet obtained the knowledge of Christ that he desires. That he's not where he wants to be. The Apostle Paul says, I have one goal. I have one thing on my mind. And I can't get it off. He says, but, but one thing I do. And those words, I do, are added in the English translation to kind of smooth out the reading and the flow of thought. But Paul literally just says, but one thing. One. It's abrupt. He, he says, I have one singular focus. Everything else I do flows into this. Every decision I make, every choice I make starts with, but one thing I do. You see, Paul's highest priority, pursuing Christ-likeness with all his might, captivates his full attention. It demands his total concentration. He is locked in. And this only makes sense, right? Maximum effort without focused concentration is useless. And we get this. Every athlete must be solely focused on the task at hand. And the funny thing is, is when we think about sports, we praise that. When, when that Olympic athlete devotes all of those years to rigorous training and then wins the gold medal, we say, that is amazing. He had one thing on his mind. He worked really, really hard and he obtained it. But then when we apply that to the Christian life, oh, that guy's a fanatic. He's too rigid. But Paul says, there's one thing that he does Paul says the runner in the Christian race must have that singular focus. He's trying to, to take hold of a crown. He's trying to win a prize. That's why in Hebrews 12.1, the author exhorts Christians to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. To run the race of the Christian life, Paul says, we must throw off every distraction that hinders us. Every weight and every obstacle that gets in the way. And we need to fix our eyes on Christ. Commentating on this verse, John Calvin said this, he said, as the runner requires to be free from entanglement and not stop his course 
on account of any impediment, but must continue his course, surmounting every obstacle. So we must take heed that we do not apply our mind or heart to anything that may divert the attention, but must, on the contrary, make it our endeavor that free from every distraction, we may apply the whole bent of our mind exclusively to God's calling. I don't want anything to get in my way in 2022. I want to strive to know Christ and to love Christ and to worship Christ. Brothers and sisters, is that your desire going into the new year? To, to grow in our relationship with the Lord, to pursue Christ's likeness, to give him all the glory. We need a, a singular focus. Solomon gave the same counsel to his son in Proverbs chapter 4. He said, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. He says, ponder the path of your feet. Every step you take, filtered through the lens, filtered through the mindset that I want to glorify Christ. There's so much fighting for our attention and our concentration today. Right? TV shows, movies, sports, video games, social media, push notifications, on and on and on. And all of those things are fine, right? There can be a place for all of those things in Christian liberty. But not. But not if they distract us from this singular focus of running the race and pursuing Christ. Right? The tyranny of urgent needs, the, the noise of famous voices, all of the the urgent headlines, the top news of the day, they all need to take a second place behind a singular focus of pursuing Christ. And Paul tells us in verse 13 that this singular focus can be characterized in three ways. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. First, in verse 13, we see that this singular focus forgets past accomplishments. Paul says, forgetting what lies behind. And that word forgetting can, can refer to having no memory of something. But here, the idea is more not paying attention. Not letting something bother you. Right? Paul's not suggesting that we have this blanket amnesia of the past where we just forget what's happened. Paul's not telling us that we can't learn from our mistakes. He's not saying that we should forget God's past mercies. Right? We, we even know that in Philippians chapter 3. In verses 4 to 11, Paul is recounting God's grace and mercy in his life. But what Paul is saying here is he's not allowing himself. Paul is not allowing himself to dwell on the past in such a way that it hinders his progress. Paul forgets his past accomplishments. He, he's not banking on his previous religious achievements in order to tell him how he's presently doing. Why? Why? Because dwelling on the past hinders our present efforts and our future progress. Right? Has this, has this ever been true of you? Are you doing this now? Well, I, I'm doing well. I prayed a few times this week. I can wait a day or two. 
You know, I read my Bible cover to cover last year. I think I'm going to slow down this year. You know, I've served the church for a while. I think I can kick back and be served a little bit. You see, when we measure our maturity based on what we've done in the past, we become lazy. We become complacent. And think about it. A runner's performance in past races does not guarantee success in future races. And so here, Paul says he forgets his past accomplishments so that he will press on in progress. But second, we see that this singular focus forgets past failures. Not only does Paul forget his past accomplishments, but he also forgets his past failures. Paul was making a break with his past sins and his, his missed opportunities. Paul is, is not allowing himself to be burdened by his previous sins. And believer, neither should you. Your past sins don't control the present or the future. Don't allow yourself to be debilitated by the guilt of your past sins. God can't forgive me for that. You know, I committed that sin and, and it makes me a second-rate Christian. The good news of the gospel is that Christ has freed you from the guilt of that past sin. In his commentary on Philippians, Matthew Harmon wrote this. He said, as believers, our only sustained glance to the past should be to the grace shown to us in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to remember the hope that we have for his return and the joy we will experience when we are completely conformed to his image. Believers, in this race of the Christian life, we don't look back. Instead, we have a a singular pursuit forward. We forget what lies behind. We eliminate distractions and then we press on. To run the race of the Christian life, we must have a singular focus. And that singular focus means that we forget what lies behind. But third, we see that this singular focus not only forgets the past, but it forges ahead. It forges ahead. Look at verse 13. He says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That word straining, it it describes stretching a muscle to its limit. It's pushing as hard as you can. Rather than banking on on past accomplishments, rather than than wallowing in the guilt of past sins, Paul says, I am going to press on. By God's grace, I'm going to run this race. And so likewise, we must exert all energy and effort striving with this singular focus. A focus that eliminates distractions and a focus that pursues Christ likeness. The Christian life is a race, and it's a race that pushes forward, forgetting the past, not banking on the past, but rather striving to gain something in the future. And so we've seen that that the Christian life, that running that race, requires a a sincere dissatisfaction. It requires a, a strenuous pursuit, exerting energy. It requires a singular focus. And finally, a steady gaze. The fourth principle for for running the race of the Christian life is a steady gaze. 
Look at verse 14. Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The singular focus of not looking back and of eliminating distractions is paired with a steady gaze on the prize ahead. He has thought behind where he's going. That word goal in verse 14, it means a mark on which to fix one's eyes. The maximum effort that's required in in any athletic endeavor requires participants to have a goal that they're striving for, a target to reach. In archery, it's the bullseye. In Paul's illustration of a race, runners must fix their eyes on the finish line. And if you've ever ran a race or if you ever tried to run, I don't know, even a mile, if, if at some point you get tired, if at some point you want to give up, if you feel like you cannot go any further, what do you do? You look up and you say, that, that's my goal. That's my target. I'm so close And the sight of that goal gives you that that burst to press on. In 1951, Florence Chadwick became the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions. One year later, in 1952, she stepped into the Pacific Ocean, determined to swim the 26 miles between Catalina Island and and the coast of California. And as Chadwick was swimming, a few small boats accompanied her. They were following to watch out for sharks, which right away would make me not want to swim that. (laughs) And then also to to be there if she needed help, if she needed food or water, or, or if she needed to be pulled out of the water. And unfortunately, that day the weather was foggy. The weather was so foggy that that she could hardly see the boats that were around her. And after about 15 hours of swimming, Chadwick begged to be taken out of the water. Her her mother, who was in one of the boats, called out to her and was trying to convince her, you're so close, you're almost there, keep going. But Chadwick was exhausted. She was physically and emotionally exhausted. And so she stopped swimming and she was pulled out of the water. And it wasn't until that she got back on the boat that she discovered that that shoreline was only half a mile away after 15 hours of swimming. At a news conference the next day, she said, All I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. See, we live in a fog of distractions. And believer, if we would only lift our eyes to see that glorious Christ that we just sang about, we would press on all the more. If we would lift our eyes from the distractions of this life, we could see the shore. We could see the goal and the prize, the the target to which we are running. And it would motivate us. What is this prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus? That upward call of God is that divine calling of salvation. That prize of salvation, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.14, is that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Consider Florence Chadwick's words. If I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Believer, for Christians, that shore is Jesus Christ. 
Believer, do you want this prize? Do you desire to press on toward the prize? To press on toward the goal? Then you must have a steady gaze. That you must fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and by God's grace, press on and strive on for holiness. It's important to note that this isn't something that we can do in our own strength. In the book of Colossians, Paul is talking about presenting everyone mature in Christ, that his ambition, his goal in ministry, not just in his life, but in his ministry, was maturity. And in Colossians 1.29, he says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. You see, Paul is, is striving, Paul is pressing on, but he's not doing it by his own efforts alone. He knows that he cannot achieve this without the grace of God. He knows the words of Jesus that apart from me, you can do nothing. And so as we approach 2022, may this passage serve as a, a diagnostic checkup on our spiritual lives. First, ask yourself, am I in the race? Have I repented of my sins and trusted in Christ? Am, am I a true follower of Jesus? And then, ask yourself, am I running the race as God intended? Does, does my pursuit to know Christ and to gain Christ, is, is my goal to be found in him? Is, is my goal to become like him? Am I running this race as God intended? Forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward. Do I have a sincere discontentment with where I'm at? Do you realize that, that you're not to where you should be spiritually? Do you have that that? longing of first Peter for the the word of God are you strenuously pursuing Christ likeness are you exerting energy and effort do you have that that singular focus forgetting those past accomplishments saying that that where I'm at today is not based on that but it's based on what I do today and what I'm going to do tomorrow do you forget those past failures, knowing that the blood of Christ has cleansed you and forgiven you, and that you can press on by his grace? Do you have a steady gaze on the goal of gaining Christ? Is your target to, to know Christ and to be conformed into his image? Do you wake up each day with that finish line in sight saying, I want this goal today. Lord, help me. And may we do all of this dependent upon his spirit. Asking the Lord to help us to, to drive complacency out of our life and to strive to press on with all of our strength to run the race of the Christian life. Is this your goal for 2022? And as the worship team comes to sing a, a final song that we may worship, uh, that we may gain Christ in this coming year, I do pray that this text that these truths from Paul would, would motivate each and every one of us. That we may all press on together to gain Christ. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we do come before you recognizing, Lord, that we do fall short of your standard. 
Lord, that there is so much more that we have to know of you. Lord, that we have so many areas of our life where, where we can continue to grow in Christ-likeness. Lord, we do ask that by your grace, in 2022, we may press on to know you. Lord, that we may glorify you this year. And we may run the race. That we may, Lord, honor you. And Lord, that one day, when we do obtain that prize, when we see you and become like you, when we cast our crowns down at your feet and worship you, Lord, may we understand that it's been a work of your grace in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.